Hello, hello everyone. Thanks so much for coming here. I'm Navjot Palkar and I'm a Pacific Fellow at Institute of Sociology and Philosophy here. Uh, this office is, uh, this building is my office. Uh, so Monica and I are going to be very simple with our talks. Uh, our talks are going to be free of jargon. So uh, like Professor Powell said that we are all normal people and we all have backstories, right? So uh, I guess to start with, I would like to ask Monica, Monica, what was your backstory? How did you get where you are now? Or, and for our young audiences, if you want to share if you faced any challenges in pursuing your scientific career. Um, yeah, hello to everyone. It's uh, really nice having me here and hi there enough. It's really a pleasure to be a speaker with you. And shortly, my uh, research topic uh, is related to antibiotics infections and um, farm animals and environment too and um, different feed compounds. Mm, I've been always into animals, and I can, when I can recall, uh, we have always been surrounded by uh, different dogs in my family home, and uh, I had to take care of them. And what's more, my grandparents had a really big garden with different trees, such as cherries, such as uh, apples, and different animals too, such as um, rabbits and chickens. And I spent many, many summers there exploring the, the world of nature and start asking questions how everything goes from biological point of view, right? And um, that's, that's why as a kid I learned how to, how to have compassion and how to respect all living uh, uh, creatures. And I should note too that I've been always surrounded by good and smart people. And um, I think because of the people, you can actually build your dreams, right? So I need to mention that it wasn't always like that, but because when I was in your age, actually, back in the high school, I struggled some obstacles during my biology classes. And um, I had a had good relation actually with my bi biology teacher. She stressed me out a lot, really. But I managed to, ma uh, to pass all of my maturity exams and I got to the university I actually wanted. And back then I met very, very passionate lecturers um, who inspired me on many, many levels. And uh, uh, right, yeah, at the, at the university, during the, uh, the classes, in-field classes, practical classes, I decided that I actually like um, science, and I would like to do what, what I am doing right now. And uh, um, after that, further, in my uh, research career, I met uh, more supervisors who were, like, always believing in me and telling me, yeah, Monica, just do it. You can do it, just do it. Like, I can recommend, like, Richard Branson in his book, like, screw it, just do it, right? I'm sorry for my word, but I strongly believe that um, having, like, good people all around you, it's, it's really crucial. So my message to you today is, like, find a way to, to have smart and inspiring people around you. And if you, if you don't have those people around you, just find them by yourself, like following really interesting people from different disciplines, right? And what's more, I can tell you that be brave, manage your fear, just live with your fear. fear. And um, it's like um, if you deal with some obstacles, just uh, just manage it, right? It's like um, uh, what I can say at the end, like quickers never win and winners never quit. So um, uh, I can really fully recommend you as well watching one of the TEDx talk, Peł na moc możliwości by Jacek Walkiewicz, where he talks about um, how to fulfill your dreams, right? So that's, that's my story. What about you, Naf? What is your story? And uh, thank you. have you dealt with any obstacles? Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned your grandparents in your backstory. I have an interesting uh, story to share as well. 
uh, my grandparents also influenced uh, what research I'm conducting right now. So to tell you briefly, I'm a social scientist, I'm a sociologist, and I study the relationship between people and their natural environments. So natural environments could be land, water, animals, trees, soil, everything, right? So uh, my grandparents, they actually migrated from Pakistan to India when the India-Pakistan partition happened, right? So um, there's this saying in Punjabi, Punjab is the region from where uh, I belong to, uh, when you overcome um, <clears throat> significant obstacles in your life, it's called crushing the heads of snakes. And according to my grandmother, my grandfather literally crushed the heads of snakes in order to settle the new land in India, right? So uh, I could sense as a child that he had a very unique relationship with the land. He had a very emotional, uh, precious relationship with the land that he worked on. And back then there were no um, tractors or anything and he worked with his hands, right? So I guess that somehow uh, that emotional attachment with the land and the environment, it transferred onto us, onto me especially. And uh, it saddens me today to see um, like all, because these are young people and they are more aware of the environmental degradation and the climate change that's going on, right? Um, so it saddens me to see the environment that we were used to that uh, is, is no longer there sorry, is no longer there, right? So extreme weather events are happening, like floods, uh, heat waves, wildfires that change our landscape uh, drastically, right? So they negatively transform our environment. So um, I guess my grandparents influenced me in that way that I attached, that I was somehow able to uh, build an attachment with the land and the environment. And I decided to study how people, uh, people's sense of place uh, gets impacted when there's a negative transformation in their immediate environment. So I, I guess I'll talk more about what I do, but before that, I should ask Monica. Monica, um, so what's the, what's the most exciting part about your research that you do? I'm yeah. sorry, what was this? <laughs> okay, sure. So about uh, the research and the most excited part. Yeah, this is a really great question. Thank you for uh, giving me this one. And I've been working in science for eight years right now. And actually, I still find many aspects which are really interesting in this career path. And one of the aspects uh, which I really like and I really appreciate is um, engaging in international collaborations. Uh, who can reach both of your knowledge and experience and actually working with different uh, teams, national, international teams, uh, helps you to understand actually your work and your questions in completely different way. And in this way, actually, you can, uh, you can grow as, uh, uh, as researcher. You can grow not only personally, but professionally. And... Um, uh, like uh, someone uh, once said, when you are in the wrong room, actually, uh, when you are the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room. And I can assure you that uh, when you collaborate with different teams, um, you will never be in the wrong room, right? And uh, my... Uh, the second uh, excited that I really, I really think it's very important in science, it's like the science is actually multitasking, uh, right? When somebody asks me, what do you do for a living? And they reflect our work as laboratory work and as um, teaching. But I think the science is beyond that because uh, my, responsibili my responsibilities uh, extend to manuscript preparation, proposal preparations, uh, attending to the conference, um, uh, manage, management, the project management, the budgets. Mm. So actually, I never get bored, right? And uh, what's more, what really excites me, it's uh, that our research actually can have direct impact to the, to the field, to the discipline. And I think that um, this is the most important part, that we can actually influence on something and we can have like direct uh, implications, right? 
what about you now? What do you think? What is uh, the most exciting part of, uh, of your research? Yeah, I agree with you, with everything you said, that traveling to places, attending conferences, and having international collaborations, um, seeing how different people see the same uh, subject from different perspectives, right? So before I answer that question in detail, Monica, would you tell me what your research is exactly about? Coming back to this question is like, um, uh, shortly, my research topic is related to looking for innovative plant-based based compounds uh, to address the issue of antibiotics overuse in uh, farm industry. And by this, uh, involves exploring different extracts from plants, such as algae, uh, to, bu to boost the immune system of animals. So, uh, simple. In simple way, it's like to do, don't get them sick at first, right? Uh, and by this, reducing the antibiotics over medication. And uh, well, uh, would you like to hear the story to simple analogy for, for my research? It's like uh, there are different enemies out there, right? Such as Joker in Batman, such as Loki from Marvel. So let's imagine that, for example, um, Loki, it's, uh, um, it's a symbolized bacteria, viruses, or different pathogens, and uh, um, which attacks our body. And actually, the diet is very important and it's very crucial to fight with those enemies and to maintain our body healthy. Because if you extensively eat burgers and drink Coca-Cola from uh, such as uh, different fast food like McDonald's, obviously you are in trouble, right? But when you incorporate uh, like plant-based diet into your uh, daily diet, uh, you can fight those enemies, right? And why? Because plants offer us different molecules that can boost our immune system. And the same, of course, applies to animal. And my second, actually, my second research topic is related to actually environmental uh, conservation, where, where we aim to mitigate the antibiotics over medication in farm animals. And by that, uh, we uh, reduce the transformation of antibiotic resistant genes to the farmlands and to the groundwater. And what about you, Nav? What, uh, what do you think, uh, what can you tell us what, is, what uh, re your research field is? Thank you so much. Uh, that's a very nice segue to what I was going to talk about. First of all, let me ask a question to our young audiences. How many you, of you are aware of the climate change? Just raise your hands. I thought so. And how many of you are worried that uh, when you grow up, the climate or the environment won't be the same as it is today? Exactly. So that is what, do you know there exists a term to describe this and that term is called solastalgia. Right? So solastalgia, all the, all the things that you feel about climate change or environmental degradation, it's called ecological anxiety or, ec or ecological grief. And solastalgia is a place-based concept of ecological grief, right? When your uh, natural environment or your familiar environment is no longer the same that you were used to, uh, you feel a certain melancholy, a certain sense of sadness, right? That's called solastalgia. Um, let me explain in a, in very, in a very simple example. Um, for example, I have an apart apartment and there's a huge window outside. Um, there's a huge window of my apartment and there's a huge tree. So I'm, I'm used to looking at that tree. I, I sit by the window and I work there and I look at the tree, it makes me feel good. There are birds around it and there's all kinds of uh, activity going on, right? And uh, one day, suppose I wake up and uh, at night there was this huge storm and the tree is no longer there. I will certainly feel, feel very sad and I will no longer be able to work at the window, right? So that is precisely what solastalgia is. And in my research, I study how people maintain a sense of place uh, when there's a negative transformation in the in your environment and how how they cope with <clears throat> how they cope with solastalgia by different um, demographic um, characteristics, for example, how men and women feel differently about it, how masculinities or femininities are constructed in relation to the environment that's undergoing negative change. So that's what I do. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. They, they touched upon very important issue of, of meeting people. So whom you meet on your way influences your career. And, and, and uh, I believe it is the true also in your cases. I hope your teachers are much better than Monica's teacher <laughs> because they brought you here. So, 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 so it seems that they want to expose you to the places where the real research is being on. So are there any questions from your side? Yes, please. Uh, hi. So it might be not really bound with all the things you said before. Uh, however, both of you mentioned your grandparents and the, uh, family uh, that you uh, had to deal with. I, um, and I would like to ask uh, how certain it is that the presence of a uh, present, sorry, presence or absence of someone that is an adult uh, in the younger years of your life uh, indicates how you would act or perform in some social um, gatherings or generally in later life. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the question. Uh, for me, I think it's really important to have an influence over you, like a personal influence. Maybe it could be your parents, it could be your grandparents, your friends, your teachers, but every person has a different story, right? Every person has different influences in their lives. So it's not mandatory or utterly important for you to have an external influence. It, it, it could come from within you, right? The inspiration or even the influence doesn't need to be in person. It could be a movie you watched, right? It could be some kind of music you listen to. It could, it can come from anywhere. The, the thing is uh, to have positive um, attitude, right? That you can do it and that you really want to do it. I think that's also one of the challenges in order to, that you are able to do what you, re, what you are really passionate about and to find what you're really passionate about. That's the challenge there. Okay. Another is the story about passion, in fact, yes, then that you can get this passion from anything from outside. Please. Um, so uh, you're both concerned about um, genetics and uh, environment. So uh, what do you think, uh, which factors have more influence of uh, uh, how a person behaves uh, the uh, environmental factors or inherited uh, traits? I guess I could try to answer that question because that's, um, that's a debate in social sciences, nature versus nurture, right? And we as social scientists, uh, as sociologists, we believe in constructionism, especially uh, there are different streams in social sciences, right? So some people, uh, they put more emphasis on, uh, we call it a positivist approach, it's, it's essentialism, that there are certain traits within you uh, from, from the birth, right? That make, that make you feel differently to, about different things. But we as sociologists believe that it's about nurture, it's about your socialization, how you are socialized in the, in the world that you are brought up in. So it, I think it varies. It it depends on your uh, upbringing, it depends on the external influences that you have from your environment, from your immediate environment, right? So it's, I don't think it's, um, it's less about um, essentialism or your biological um, makeup or something like that, right? So it's more about your socialization. Thank you. Do you agree? <laughs> okay. Some other questions? Don't have to be questions. It can be also some remark, or, or you can tell your story, or you can mention the people that you met, as, as they did, that inspired you. But if not, it is the case. So we now we will have a. Oh, there is one more. Okay, I didn't notice. Sorry. Uh, so. You said that um, men and women perceived climate change uh, differently. 
So I wanted to ask about those differences. Uh, what, are, what are they? Yeah, well, uh, it's not a fact, but it's uh, a perception of different scholars and different disciplines, right? So there's a stream in environmental sociology, it's called ecofeminism. So if you are familiar with um, the name of Vandana Shiva, then, then you might be familiar with what ecofeminism is. So uh, according to ecofeminism, women are more close to nature. And it's all about then again going into the debate of essentialism and nature versus nurture, right? Uh, so according to ecofeminism, women are closer to nature due to their inherent nurturing, caring, um, biological makeup maybe, right? But but we as sociologists know that it's not biological, it's it's about your socialization. That by the, uh, in the very beginning when you are born, right? So people start to socialize you according to your sex, whether you are a male or a female, then you become a man or a woman, right? And your attitudes get shaped as you are uh, influenced by external uh, factors like your parents, your classmates, the TV, the radio, and everything, right? And then you uh, develop certain attitudes as a woman or as a man. For example, uh, to put it very simply, uh, small boys, they are given different toys than small girls to play with, right? So small little girls are given dolls and colorful things, and little boys are given robots and tanks and stuff like that, right? So th from the very beginning, the attitude attitudes uh, become, um, they, they shape the attitudes, the external factors, right? So as you grow up, you develop different relationships with all things around you according to your gender, right? So if you are a man, you will have a different relationship with the environment or with, with any, any of the external uh, factors, right? And as a woman, you will have a different relationship. So that's what I'm trying to study because gender is constructed, right? It's not inherent, it's not biological. It's very much constructed in the society that we live in and different societies have different definitions of gender, right? So uh, maybe in the Western society, we have a binary class classifications, man and woman, right? And in different, uh, maybe if you go to Asia or if you go to India, there are they accept three genders, right? They they are they are socially accepted. There's no stigma attached to it. So um, so I'm studying how as and and these traits that you develop as men or women, it, it, it's called masculinity or femininity, right? So uh, I'm studying how when men interact with the environment, how their masculinities get constructed and how they how they perceive the environmental differently than women and how femininities are developed in, in relation to the in relation to the environment and the land, water and everything. So I'm I'm basing my research in a very small agricultural community because I do qualitative work and it's not possible for me to, in qualitative research, you cannot do like a huge geographical area or thousands of people, right? So you have to limit your sample to a couple hundred people, uh, maybe maybe less than hundred people, and treat it, treat, uh, maybe treat it as a representative sample if you can, but there's no obligation because it's qualitative research and uh, it, it, it has all different kinds of uh, perceptions and analysis and um, understandings, right? So yeah, in, in precisely that's what I do, how men and women and why men, uh, these attitudes differ in relation to the environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Monica, does gender count in your research field as well? Or it doesn't matter? It doesn't actually. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I have a question because a lot of people believe that electronic cars are the best source, best solution to uh, help with uh, our climate problems and I personally don't believe it because for example in Poland the uh, power plants are f fueled by coal and fossil fuels and this, uh, the batteries are basically powered on coal. And do you think that electronic and hybrid cars are the best solution to uh, stop maybe climate change or do you have any maybe substances for it? Okay, so um, I might not have the answer to it exactly because I'm not uh, 
physicist or um, a chemist, right? So I'm a social scientist. I study how people think maybe what's the best solution to it? What, what do people think, right? So like Kinga said, we live in a post-truth era, right? So right now, maybe the truth of the time is that we are running out of fossil fuels. So the thing that people could come up with is electric vehicles. But we all know that it, electric vehicles also have a lot of um, uh, collateral damage, right? So they are they are doing more harm to the environment that, that, that were expected, right? That was expected. Expected. So, no, I don't think that e-vehicles are the solution. I think clean energy is the solution, but how to harness clean energy from the environment, that's, the, that's a question for, I don't know, maybe physicists or geologists, so maybe they could answer to it. Thank you. Yes, Thank, thank you for your question. I, I, I am chemistry background, so I, I can respond to your question. So. Do, do you know our energy demands are rising extensively day by day? Okay. So obviously we are looking for renewable option and even I agree with you that EV is not the solution. Uh, but uh, I can suggest, uh, as you pointed, the renewable hydrogen and even biomass is the uh, possible for future, okay, biofuel especially. So because, uh, you know, I mean, if I am having biofuel or gasoline, one kg, I mean one kg of gasoline and one kg of battery. So one kg of gasoline gives 20 times higher power than one kg of battery. So that's why, I mean, although people are using from long time and biomass is not getting to, I mean, not getting to distrain or getting finished because every year we are generating almost uh, 170 gigaton of uh, I think mega gigaton of uh, biomass. So that is sufficient for our future energy. And uh, yeah, that will be the possible option. Thank you. You raised very important questions of our life. So, so if there are no more questions at the moment, there is there's still one there, yeah. Okay, I want to ask about what other fields are, um, how to say, <laughs> what other fields are affected by our gender that we do not know about or things? What other fields? Yeah, like you said about the environment, mm -hmm. that men and women has like different perspective. Maybe it's not only the environment. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, what I are think those things? Everything that we come across in life, it's impacted by our gender. Uh, because, because as, as I said before, uh, from the very beginning when we are born, our gender starts constructing, right? So it's a construction, the society constructs it, right? So we learn how to become men or women. We are not born men or women. Right, so it's it's a different sex and gender are different things. Maybe uh, if we if we go into a binary classification, we are born as male or female, right? But we learn how to be men and women, and there are different things that men and women learn because the society makes them learn different things. So women are uh, taught to wear dresses, men are taught to wear pants, right? As a very simple example. So um, to answer your question, uh, apart from environment, everything everything uh, in the world is impacted by our gender. How, not impacted by our gender, but how we perceive it, how, how we perceive everything is impacted by our gender. Oh, okay. Okay, and we have yet another question here. Um, well, uh, I wanted to ask about gender again. Uh, so I agree with what you said, of course. However, I wanted to ask um, about the biological factor of it. Uh, since, uh, well, I can't help think, to think that um, if something is uh, said to us for such a long time, for example, like uh, you were born a female and you were forced uh, to do female things, yeah? But does it not become bio biological if it's like since the beginning of our life to the end of our life? 
Yeah, so that's the question. It does not become biological, but we think it's become biological, right? Because our mind is hardwired the way, uh, it's, it's hardwired to think that it's biological, right? Because today you are seeing we have all kinds of different genders, right? People are expressing themselves because there's, uh, we have internet, we have everything, and there's more liberty, there's more freedom of speech, right? So people are expressing their gender more freely, how they really feel, right? But it's not biological. It's, it's all learned behavior. We learn how to become men and women, but we don't realize it because that's the way it is. And that's why uh, sociologists and social scientists are important because they make you think uh, to look at the extraordinary in the ordinary. The things that we see as ordinary, they are not. They are extraordinary. And that's the, that's the task of social scientists to find why they are extraordinary. Right. So to answer your question, we think it's biological because that's normal for us, but it's not because that's the extraordinary thing in it. It's learned. It's all learned and constructed. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. It was really inspiring. And, and uh, thank you again for, for, for this thank interesting you. talk. We'll have a short break, 25 minutes break. So you can still ask questions, and I encourage you to, to ask questions to, to, to those who already had their presentation and also to those who will have their presentation. So we are meeting here again in 25 minutes. Mm -hmm.